In 2014, millions around the world watched as a 29-year-old paraplegic from Brazil used a mind-controlled robotic suit to kick the official ball during the World Cup opening ceremony. While it was a brief moment, it was a kick that was years in the making. Na abertura da Copa do Mundo, o país do futebol conquistou uma vitória para a ciência. Devolver a um jovem paraplégico a possibilidade de andar de novo e chutar uma bola. Mais de 150 pessoas de 25 países trabalharam por 17 meses. Tempo recorde para um projeto dessa magnitude. As soluções tecnológicas desenvolvidas para criar o exoesqueleto o tornam pioneiro no mundo. Suas ações são controladas por comandos do cérebro do próprio paciente. Eletrodos aplicados a uma touca captam os sinais dos neurônios e os retransmitem para o equipamento. O equipamento, por sua vez, conta com dispositivos que devolvem ao paciente a informação de pisar no chão através de sinais vibratórios no braço. So, how did that happen? Well, it took decades of research by Duke University neuroscientist Dr. Miguel Nicolelis to make that kick a reality. His pioneering brain-machine interfacing research could mean millions of injured people will one day be able to walk again. And Dr. Nicolelis joins us now from Sao Paulo. Welcome to Full Frame. Oh, hi. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Talk to me about this brain-machine interface. How would you explain it to us? Well, basically, about 15 years ago, uh, my friend John Chapin and I uh, were studying brain circuits, and we realized that we could actually create a direct interface between living brain tissue and machines using a, a computational uh, strategy that we developed in our labs. And in the beginning, we thought that that was just uh, to to study, you know, the brain circuits in a in a better way, but we. We found out a couple of years later that that could be the beginning of some completely new approach to, to treat patients suffering from severe paralysis. So you have this concept, and then in 2002, you start working with monkeys. What did you find then? Well, at that point, we realized that we could directly transmit to robots uh, the voluntary motor intention of uh, monkeys. So when the monkey wanted to move, uh, its arm or its leg, we realized that we could record the electrical signals produced by the brain of the animal and decode the intention to move uh, that the animal was producing in the shape of these electrical brainstorms and translate it into digital commands that a machine can understand. And in 2003, we published a paper where we showed that our monkeys had learned to control the movements of a robotic arm just by thinking. They didn't need to move their own bodies. They just needed to imagine the kind of uh, arm movement they wanted to perform to play a video game. And in by doing so, they would get some reward, some juice as a reward for accomplishing the task uh, just by imagining these movements and making a robotic arm uh, move a computer cursor on a, on a screen. Does the brain get, receive something back from the robot? I mean, is this a two-way street? Yes, it, it, it soon became a two-way uh, communication between brains and machines. Uh, first, we did that using visual feedback, so the animals uh, could see uh, the device performing a task under the control of the animal's brain. But later, we also uh, added to it uh, tactile feedback, so the animals could have a, a, a sense of touch that was generated by sensors placed on the robotic device or in virtual devices like body avatars, so that when the animal imagine a movement and this robotic device touch something, uh, the animal would sense what was being touched by the, by the robotic device. So this two-way communication allowed the animals to incorporate this device as an extension of their own bodies. It seems like uh, science fiction to some of us. Uh, as you were going through this process, uh, were you kind of, you must have been astonished. Oh, yeah, many times, yes. The first time we saw monkeys controlling a robotic arm without moving their own arms, uh, we basically couldn't speak in the lab. You know, the, the students and everybody involved uh, that were watching the experiment were completely speechless. 
And then as we progress, as you said, to the, the World Cup demonstration, and we saw the patients could take, uh, you know, an enormous benefit from this uh, technology, we also had great moments in uh, the past two years, uh, you know, seeing uh, our eight patients uh, basically improving their condition by using brain machine interfaces. So w when you take this from monkeys in a lab and you have a much broader look at things, I mean, where do you see this going? I mean, this could impact millions of people, couldn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We, we have found a, a couple of, of things with these eight patients that we work with here in Brazil. They are very, very important. First, of course, they could use the brain machine interface to control this uh, lower limb exoskeleton and uh, regain the ability to walk in our laboratory. And, but also, by the fact that they're walking again just a, an hour a day, a couple of times a week, we are seeing uh, signs of neurological, partial neurological recovery. So these patients are regaining some movements, they're regaining some sensitivity below the level of the spinal cord lesion, and they're you know, improving uh, in, in terms of autonomic function, cardiovascular function, gastrointestinal function. So the entire quality of life of these patients have uh, improved significantly. So I think in the, in the next uh, few years, we are going to see the technologies spread to many applications in clinical neurology. Here's what's really interesting about this, and we've got a piece of video that we want to show, and I want you to talk a little bit about this. This has led to man-to-man, brain-to-brain communication. What we're looking at here, this is at the University of Washington, where researchers are demonstrating how the signals from one person's brain are able to control the hand motions of another person within a split second of sending the signal. Now, this sounds remarkable, but it's actually happening and you hear the cheers uh, of these researchers, probably the same sort of thing, Miguel, that you've gone through in your labs in the past. Yes. Tell us about this yes. as well. Yeah, it's about uh, two years ago, in the beginning of 2013, um, my students and I reported in a paper the possibility of creating this brain-to-brain -brain interface in rats. Uh, we published a paper that, you know, described this proof of concept when uh, a signal from one uh, rat's brain was delivered to a second animal, and the second animal basically decided what to do to go left or right or to press a, a, a left bar versus a right uh, bar, just based on the signal that it was receiving from the first animal. That was the first report on the brain-to-brain -brain interface, and my good friends at uh, University of Washington uh, basically took that almost immediately to uh, a proof of concept in humans. And just about a month ago, we, we published two more papers, one in rats and one in monkeys, showing that this concept can be generalized to multiple brains interacting to achieve a common goal. We call that a brain net. And we had about three monkeys, for instance, collaborating mentally to uh, move a, a, an avatar arm in 3D. So the arm could only be moved if at least two of these monkeys were mentally combining their brain activity to uh, create this X and Y movement in 3D. And it turned out that in a few sessions, the animals learned to do that, and they were able to basically create a, a, a set of brains working together to achieve this common motor task. And, and as you tinker with this, obviously you can look at the potential for spinal cord injuries, brain injuries, but does it raise ethical questions? I mean, as you look into the future, I mean, can we go too far? Oh, well, of course, we always can go too far. But uh, that's why it's important to uh, describe this technology and this science, not only in scientific papers to the scientific community, but also in every opportunity possible to discuss that with, you know, with society, so that society can take a look at this and and can decide what are the applications that are uh, acceptable, what is proper, uh, what is not acceptable. Uh, as a scientist, I think part of our mission, uh, certainly my mission, I, I believe, is to communicate as broadly as possible what is real, what is science fiction, and how far can we go, and let society decide how this is going to be applied. My, my own opinion is that the main application of brain machine interface, uh, at least for the next uh, couple of decades, will be in medicine, in rehabbing, rehabilitation medicine for Parkinsonian patients, for uh, spinal cord injury patients, uh, patients suffering from brain trauma, 
and a variety of other neurological disorders. As you look at your uh, remarkable achievements, uh, what stands out the most for you? Well, it's difficult to, to select a single step. You know, uh, Juliano's kick last year was perhaps the most moving moment of my scientific career. I was just behind him. I was measuring things and looking for the moment of the kick, but there was a moment that I couldn't be a scientist anymore, and I just dropped everything I was doing, waiting for that second, that split second in, in which he had to make a decision and communicate with his brain activity to the exoskeleton that was, he was ready to kick the ball. And certainly that I will never forget, but that kick would not have happened uh, without the work of tens of graduate students, postdocs, scientists, mathematicians, uh, engineers, people working since the late 80s in my lab, in John Chapin's lab, in labs all over the world that made that moment possible. And I think the symbolism of that moment is that this is just the beginning. That kick was just the, the startup. Of a, of a lot to come in the next few years. Just the beginning, but unfortunately, we've come to our end. Thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's been a delight. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation.